I went home, I put, I think it was like $2,000 into like one of those coins. And I swear like the next week it was like 25 grand. You didn't know celebrities, you didn't have connections to them. They were just these people you saw on TV. Yeah. We're really like the first product in the space that actually feels like a finance and trading app. Jake, thank you so much for coming on the show, man. It's an absolute pleasure to meet you. Um, we were introed and I got to go through your content. I'm really excited. I actually love watches as well. So this is an episode I've been looking forward to. Excited to be here, man. And yeah, recognize the Wimbledon. F first thing I saw. Dude, not trying to like flex it or anything, but I picked this seat for a reason. Um, dude, you've been building something really cool right now. I see you online putting out content, really diving in. Um, for people that watch the show, I just go right in. You're building something really unique in the watch world right now, and it's attached to the crypto space, which we're going to get into. But how'd you even get started in the watch industry? Like what pushed you that route? Yeah, um, definitely got involved from a very different angle than what I'm, you know, tackling now. So basically in, you know, in the early days of Instagram, uh, I think a better way to introduce it is, you know, the watch industry and this space, it's been very difficult to break into for the last 150 to 170 years. The industry has operated with families based in Switzerland that, you know, a watchmaker has been the grandpa and he's given birth to, you know, the next big watchmaker. And then next thing you know, there's, you know, Breguet or, you know, Jaeger Le Couture. And that's how these brands came to be. Um, social media gave people the ability to disrupt industries, right? And Instagram in specific, um, one of my buddies from growing up started a watch strap company that was leveraging Instagram to build its brand equity. And I was, I was fascinated with how quickly the company was able to attract an audience, sell product. Um, and just overall, you know, kind of like disrupt culture and be provocative, which is, you know, my personality. Um, so basically, uh, got into the watch world by helping him build his company and essentially leading the sales and business development wing, uh, and just got to meet a lot of people around the world, kind of see how there's different, there's different roles that people play in the watch world. Like I've been to, you know, the pursue where the AP factory is based. I've been to, you know, guys in New York city and Hong Kong that have, you know, 700 pre-owned Rolexes. And then I've also been, you know, in the offices of celebrity jewelers where, you know, rappers are trying on diamond bust down. So, you know, being able to see the entire industry, see how it was able to grow on social media, also attend a lot of different conferences, watch trader conferences, watch weeks, uh, you know, watches and wonders, um, has allowed for me to kind of get a grip on the industry. And that's like, uh, kind of like my segue in was Instagram. And then I think just being able to travel and really build my brand in the space and see how it functions is what allowed me to get the confidence to do what I'm doing today. Yeah, no. And you made a really good point there about social media back in the day. People forget how easy it was to go viral. Like now you got to work your ass off, make a crazy edit of a great clip of like the most valuable information you could think of. Back then you used to be able to post a picture of an AP, hashtag Audemars Piguet, and you might go viral if it's a nice piece. So like, were you part of taking advantage of that time on Instagram or more recent? Yeah, no, that was, uh, it's actually funny. I remember you know, Instagram, I was posting on it. I think I was probably one of the first 100,000 people to use the app, like the OG days. And I remember we used to always, you know, we're, we're in high school at the time, troll each other. And we created an Instagram account called Miami Ballers. Not. And that was the name of the account. And we would just post like the LV store in the Bow Harbor shops, you know, like just a picture of it and be like, balling at LV. Ball, ball harder shops, the ball harder shops instead of Bow Harbor. And uh, we were posting like hurricanes, like, you know, pictures of them. There was some videos at the time, like in the valet at Bow Harbor. And these photos would get like a thousand likes, 2000 likes. And, you know, my Instagram now has like, you know, everybody I've ever met on it. And sometimes I have trouble getting like 400 likes, you know? So this was definitely like when Instagram, like if you put up something cool and you put a hashtag, it would go viral. And, you know, I think that's also what attracted me a lot to Horace and the company was, you know, I'm over here pursuing a degree in accounting and my buddy from growing up is running a company through Instagram. And basically, you know, Dan Bilzerian, uh, Drew Brees, 
you know, Michael Strahan and other, you know, A-list celebrities are just popping up in the comments and the DMs and the likes. It's like, oh, like Jake Paul just liked our photo. And it's, it's like, what? Like, that's possible. Like, do you like nowadays it's like everybody kind of knows one or two celebrities, you know, if, if, if you're entrepreneurial, you're doing something, everybody knows a couple people. Um, but like 10 years ago, you know, assuming we grew up normal, like you didn't know celebrities, you didn't have connections to them. They're just these people you saw on TV. And I think, you know, Instagram in specific compared to other platforms was really that first social media app that like brought those people to your fingertips. And now, now it's, I don't want to say it's easy, but you can easily get into communication in some way, shape or form with these types of individuals. So yeah, definitely those days. Yeah, no, for sure. And and I agree. Social media is so cool. Like even from the perspective of this show, I don't have like a crazy following or a massive audience yet. And I've still been able to at least get in touch with huge names that I followed for years and some have even come on the show and it's all because of me leveraging social media. And I think like people who realize that early really won. And you mentioned the name of the company, Horace Straps, which I'm sure people know they've really blown up. You had a a pretty integral role in that. What did you learn from that experience when you were there? Oh man, Horace was, uh, was a whole entire thick chapter textbook, um, of life, you know, a lot. Um, I think the first and foremost, you gotta, you gotta remember that like everybody in life is always going to tell you based off their experience, what's the best advice they can give. And I think Horace was definitely the first time where I was like, all right, like there's obviously, you know, the way my dad wants me to do something or what my college friends want, you know, or see how the world works. But Horace was the first time where I was like, yo, like I want to build this brand. I don't want to pursue, you know, working at an accounting firm. I want to be on the road. I want to work for my phone. I want to leverage Instagram. And I think, you know, I learned to just like do it myself. And, you know, it's funny. I've always used this, this example, but have you heard about the red car theory? No, no. So, you know, the red car theory is basically where it's like, all right, if I ask you, how many red cars have you seen today? You're going to say, uh, I don't know, like eight, 12. I don't know. I didn't even count. Yeah. But if I told you earlier this morning, Hey, every red car you see is a thousand dollars. And then today I ask you, how many red cars have you seen? You'd say, Oh, I saw like 33 of them. I counted everywhere. I'd be locked in. Yeah. Because why there's opportunity that comes from noticing. So, you know, a lot of people will go about living their lives day by day, just like doing what's in front of them, doing what they're told or what they think is right. Horace taught me to like, you know, think deeper. Like when you meet somebody, like how can they assist you? How can you leverage that network that they have to, you know, somehow make the brand better? Who do they know? What, what do they think of you? Like when you meet them for the first time, like, it, it, it kind of it kind of made me act right and become an adult very quickly, uh, which I think was an experience I needed yeah. immediately out of college. Um, and then also just straight entrepreneurship. Like, you know, you have a product, it sells itself. The watch straps are beautiful. Yeah. How do you maximize that? How do you make the brand even bigger than, you know, what is laid out in front of it? And, you know, we, we, we manipulated every angle, um, you know, from having bundle packs to an authorized retailer system to, you know, using big jewelers and watch traders as marketing partners. Um, you know, the hustle and the mindset, like, which now plays a big role, I think, in what we're doing today, you know, how we leverage our data, how we, you know, optimize the experience, um, for brands as well as users. Like it's, uh, it's important to kind of have that experience early on running a company from nothing. Yeah. And I, I, you make a great point with the experience portion of what you're talking about. When I interview people like you, I'm always trying to take away certain things like one, what do people have in common that are successful? What are they doing like early on before the successful points? And a lot of it comes from unexperienced or a, a basket of experiences that they have. And for you to be able to go back and look through all of those and take things away that make you a better entrepreneur CEO now are really important. And like, you could tell you have those traits, like just the way you go back and highlight certain things. You continue on the journey, Horace, you start to get into NFTs, who who didn't get into NFTs and then who didn't lose money in NFTs. Um, 
before we go into exactly what you're building, why did you get into the NFTs other than the hype? And when did you start to see there was an opportunity with watches and NFTs together? Yeah, uh, great question. I think, you know, I left Horace in May of 2021 and I had all the free time in the world. So I had the ability to really spend 12, 14, six hours a day just doing what I wanted while a lot of my peers, you know, were busy with work. So I use this time to really get, you know, deep into Twitter, start reading up on like the actual, you know, how, how, how a consensus model works. What is a proof of stake blockchain? What's a proof of work? Why is Ethereum uh, a good chain? What's Arbitrum? You know, not just like recognizing like, oh, there's bored apes, like let me buy some and sell them. But more so like what exactly is going on here? What's this technology and why are people clinging on to it? And, you know, the where it all kind of changed for me was basically I was just like interested in crypto and I was playing around with DeFi very early on. I met up with one of my friends who's, you know, pretty famous. And we met up with a, a venture fund slash hedge fund. They they did both. They invested, you know, early stage projects, but then also were, were trading regularly. And um, they basically, they sat down with us and they were like, hey, like, I think we can make you guys a lot of money. Um, right now, what we're doing is we're tracking these wallets that major, like, like a major VC fund. Um, the name of it was uh, Multicoin Capital. If you're familiar, some people are. They mixed reputation, but overall great fund at the time. And in general, the partners are extremely intelligent. Uh, basically, Multicoin Fund was placing liquidity in different pools. And then every day they would basically move to a new new LP. So they would you know, take $100,000, the next day put it here, put it here, put it here. And this fund was just tracking their wallets and tracking their movements and doing the same as quickly as possible. And they had a list of all these coins that were getting a lot of movement. So they had a dinner. They're like, look, if you put $25,000, this is to my friend. They're like, if you put $25,000 into this array and basket of coins by, you know, next year and nine months, you'll have like $30 million based off what we're thinking, like some crazy number. And now you remember 2021, this was possible. I mean, everything was possible. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Time. <laughs> so I, I, I decided, I'm like, all right, like, let me look into this myself. I went home, I put, I think it was like $2,000 into like one of those coins. And I swear like the next week, it was like 25 grand. It was like, holy, this works. And um, next thing you know, I'm just like hooked. And that was kind of like my entrance way into DeFi. And that was kind of like where I started taking this stuff like really seriously. And, you know, what what got me really attracted to bringing watches on chain and tying in this industry was, for one, um, having to find out what was next in my life after Horace. I never wanted to leave the watch world. The, the f connections and friends and a lot of the people I even consider family um, didn't want to say like goodbye to that. Um, at the same time as well, you know, NFTs in specific, like I've never seen a piece of technology grab like Gen Alpha, Gen Z and millennials attention quicker and harder than NFTs and crypto, like the gamification of trading, the digital communities and the kinetic energy and group chats and just like the overall um, camaraderie and, you know, social uh, reputation that you could build for yourself in this network, like you know, in the first year of NFT trading or the first, the banner year, 2021, NFTs had more volume than the pre-owned watch market. Like that's unheard of. You actually, like, I think it was $41 billion in NFTs got traded their first year. That's insane. That's insane. That's, that's like, and I just, I knew that this was going to make its way into other, you know, industries that needed disruption. And, you know, yeah, one thing led to another. I just kind of, I kind of saw it really well. And, and I think what, what really clicked it was with the watch trading groups where people trade watches, like the picture of the watch, the name, the model, the manufacturer, the, um, the price, and just looked like NFTs and people yeah. inside these group chats. And it just was like, all right, like there's gotta be something here. No, no. I mean, that's a great description. And I, I listened to you speak on another podcast before getting on here and you made that point. And I think that's what really resonated with me 
it started to make more sense because I agree. Like when you look at an NFT, it's just a JPEG with a name and a price and you can buy it if you want. A watch is somewhat similar. You created this, you turn this idea into watches.io and you have, a, you have a quote that I really liked and I think it's a good time for you to dive into this and it's, we're not a Web3 company, we're a watch company. You have the backing of the crypto community. You still get that. Why do you say you're not a Web3 company and you're a watch company? Yes, yeah, I think it's super important, um, especially when you're building a startup that you kind of remember your focus. You know, like it's really easy to try to solve the world and be Superman when you're a CEO, you know, like I have capital, I have a team, you know, like the my business partners and the engineering team that we have can like literally build anything. And just think about what you have when you, like I could tell the team, hey, today guys, like let's start solving this problem, you know, or whatever. Um, kind of just alluded to it, but it's really important to stay focused on solving problems and solutions. Like there's a million ways to tie a shoe, right? But you can't run without your shoes tied. So it's really important when you're building a company that you remember what the core problems that you're aiming to solve are and building a roadmap around that. Like for one, the watch market is still not transparent in terms of pricing. How do you expect there to be, you know, ex executable, you know, high frequency trading when you still have prices that are just completely scattered and all over the place and totally opaque and non-transparent? You know, you need to have price transparency. You need to have charts. You need to have the ability to make data-driven, unemotional investments in, trade, in trades. Two, you know, people right now are concerned when they buy a watch online about just in general, the authenticity. I think there's a $2 billion fake watch market or 2 billion w fake watches per year are sold. It's, it's bigger than the actual watch market in and of itself. Um, so, you know, you got to solve for that problem. You know, people, when they buy a luxury watch are concerned just in general about the shipment process. Like, is it going to make it here? Is there going to be an issue at, at, at customs? You know, is it going to get damaged? And then on top of it as well, you know, the the way that people like to buy watches traditionally when they're wearing them is they like to buy them from a trusted source or a jeweler or a watch trader. And, you know, even though marketplaces and online platforms have increased the accessibility to learn about watches and you can see a lot of watches at the end of the day, like, you know, a lot of people buy their watches IRL. Mm -hmm. So how do you actually solve for the lack of transactions that are taking place online and watches. It's not, it's not like, you know, home goods on Amazon, everybody's buying online, like the watch market's still very physical. And, you know, those are problems that we're focused on now, blockchain, right? Like a lot of web three companies, you know, first off, there's a lot of bullshit in this space. Like, let me, you know, raise money. Let me sell a dream and bring together, you know, developers and make something happen. Two, there's a lot of projects that are focused on, you know, oh, like we're going to build this, but on Cosmos or, you know, this was popular on Avalanche. We're going to take it and build it on Solana. And a lot of businesses aren't building for, they're, they're, they're creating solutions or they're just creating business use cases. They're not actually solving for core, you know, existing problems. So I like to use blockchain technology. I love the fact that we're leveraging 721s for physical assets. We're, you know, building on ramp and off ramp solutions. We're, we're, we're creating a, you know, open source, non-custodial, non-custodial contract, like, you know, for people to transact, like we're, we're, we're using this technology. So technically we're leveraging blockchain, but like we're focused on the watch market and watch traders and collectors and investors. And that's our focus. So we're a watch company not a blockchain company, like, you know, Amazon isn't a, you know, warehouse and I mean, well, Amazon's an everything company, but you know, like, uh, we work isn't a, you know, coffee, light and table company. We work is a, you know, a, a co-working space. So we're a watch company that just uses blockchain. And you mentioned, um, you mentioned problems in the space and I, I agree with you on all of them. It is still a very in real life business purchase process. Um, but you mentioned a lot of good problems. Not, I mean, not good problems, but problems that do occur. <laughs> what are you at Watches.io doing to solve those problems? So for one, 
you know, I mentioned data-driven investing into watches, right? Like, you know, sucking out that emotional factor and just turning this into something where it's like, oh, like I bought 15 Rolexes today. You don't even care what dials, you know, the, the condition was this condition, the price is at this price below market. And you, you know, you took out leverage to make that execution. Um, so, you know, for one, I think our platform compared to a lot of the other ones that are out there, we're really like the first product in the space that actually feels like a finance and trading app. When you log on to watches IO and, you know, currently only our beta is publicly available. It actually looks and feels a lot more like Robin hood than it does look like a, you know, luxurious eBay or some other peer to peer high end marketplace for watches to get sold. I'm not really focused on trying to sell you on the beautiful gold and how it looks on your wrist and the fluted bezel shimmers so nicely. I'm more focused on, you know, this is what the last like 27 watches, you know, Wimbledon's were sold at. This is what the assets worth. This is, you know, how liquid it is. And, you know, giving you the ability to leverage data to make a, an investment, you know, that's, that's for one, two, you know, the next rollout in our product is obviously a trading exchange. And, you know, it has a lot of features that are different than the traditional, uh, online web two marketplace. Definitely want to, you know, cliffhang and leave the, the audience excited, but you know, now you're able to leverage what's so great about, you know, the Chrono 24s of the world and the stock X's of the world. Uh, but also, you know, what's working from blur OpenSea, magic Eden, which are three extremely popular NFT marketplaces or tensor trade, another one that does such a great job and kind of just like taking the best features from all of these and giving users something that feels like a, you know, Binance exchange meets Bloomberg terminal, but for watches, you know, there's, um, there's a lot of cool stuff in the roadmap. Also, sorry, I didn't mention this part in the beginning, but we also have a news aggregator for some reason. It's like not that popular on the website compared to the portfolio page, but we, we actually bring in daily news every single day on the watch market. And it's really cool to see, cause you'll go on Instagram at 10 AM in the morning and see like, Oh, uh, you know, Autumn Arpigay, you know, released a collaboration with, you know, a new brand and you go onto our platform and there's like 15 articles all from different, you know, extremely insightful authors writing about that topic. And you're able to just see kind of like what the industry's perception is of Audemars Piguet's collaboration. Then you're able to see on the other page, how the watch is moving in terms of the market price that week. And you can kind of like put two and two together, like, oh, like AP right now is becoming socially popular but maybe like the price isn't going up as quickly as I would have thought. And you're able to just start making inferences. And that's, you know, the first inkling of people becoming, you know, smarter investors, you know, not just collectors, like, you know, somebody that's actually thinking about the financial opportunity of a luxury watch. And doing homework when I was looking stuff up about you and kind of reading a few things, you mentioned that there is not a lot of like concrete data on watches, like, charts and when to buy and a lot of watch traders or people in the aftermarket watch industry are kind of just going off of group chats or like i've seen what that watch is worth or what people will pay for it that's a pretty good price i'll buy it and that shocked me for like an industry that has so much volume and deals in such expensive luxury goods that there wouldn't be like real data driven technology and then i started looking it up because i'm into watches i like looking at that stuff too and i couldn't find it either so when i started to go back it's you always look at things a little different when you know the back end of it. So I thought the charts and everything that you guys post on watch IOs were, were awesome. They're great. Now I think they're even better because I know the back end, the reason for it, there's a lack of it in the market. That's probably why I was so attracted to it right when I saw it. And then another thing that you mentioned, another thing that you mentioned in there was the Robin hood aspect. I love Robin hood super bullish on the company. I think they're doing a great job of like attracting younger individuals who want to invest and they got the bad rap with the GameStop thing, just bad timing, I think on their part. I think it's an amazing platform. And one of the driving reasons why I love that company is the news aspect. I think they do such a great job because I like investing, I'm passionate about it. So I'll go look up the Bloomberg articles and read certain things. But the average investor who just wants to invest, but also just know a little bit about what they're doing, because I don't suggest anybody just blindly invest, do some homework. Robinhood does a great job of feeding you that information and you highlighting that part of the brand 
I think is going to be huge. It might not be something that's widely used right now, but I think that you telling me that makes me more inclined to get on the platform because I have an uncle who's completely put me on watches. I grew up going about Harbor shops with him learning about all the brands and not just the main brands, everything. And he owned a Patek 5711 stainless steel. And we always have talked about it. I've got it for like $15,000. Literally, literally, I think he paid like $21,000 for it. And he bought it and, and I, he would let me wear it. And I was, it was amazing. He owned it, wore it, used that thing. I called him one day because I saw that they discontinued it. And I said like, uncle bleep, <laughs> they just discontinued the 5711. Do you still have it? We haven't talked about it in a while. He's like, yes, I do. Let me, I haven't even seen it. And he's like, holy shit. The watch is worth like 90 K at the time of this happening. And me, if I was an investor of the Patek 5711 and I was using your platform and I was storing it in there on my watch list or what I own and I got the news article, you're, you're providing value right there. I'm able to go if I want to flip out of this watch or sell it. I now know, holy shit, let me capitalize on the hype right now. Boom. So like, I love that you mentioned that because it's a huge part of the brand. Yeah, no, it's, um, and, and going with that, you know, our demographic, right? There's been a large shift and it goes into social media towards, you know, democratization and management of your own personal finances, right? You know, 10 years ago, it was, you know, get a, an advisor or, you know, invest in the S&P. But these days with, you know, the Robinhood effect with crypto nowadays, like our generation seeks larger returns. We have shorter investment horizons and we, you know, like to manage our own personal positions at a lot greater of a rate. Um, we are also a demographic that has other interests than just, you know, stocks and crypto. For example, you were mentioning before we were chatting, like your interest in sneakers, like, you know, the sneaker market immensely, like you could probably make a ton of money, just like arbitraging, you know, one pair of sneakers in one market to another. And, you know, that being said, our generation is going to demand financial products built around things that we know a lot about. And you know, everybody wants to make that hundred X, right. But like, like think of it from this perspective, if there was a product like watches IO for watches, you know, now there's a world where somebody who has a hundred dollars to their name, but knows so much about watches or somebody who has a hundred dollars to their name and knows a ton about sneakers can now become a millionaire off their knowledge. You've never had that ability to actually take your passion and your knowledge of something and turn that into more than now with digital products being created around these alternative assets. You can go and you can invest, you know, a thousand dollars into masterworks, get exposure to a Kusama painting. And when they exit, you can get a return. Now you can like literally go to museums, look at art, read up on art, you know, get involved in art history, take those classes in high school that everybody tells you won't get you into college, but you're passionate about, and you can turn that into a way to make money or trading cards. You can go to all X, Y, Z, epic platform for watch trade or for, um, for trading card trading. And you can see how, you know, the prices of cards and Kobe Bryant rookie year cards are trading at these prices on eBay and PWCC. And now you can make a huge return on knowing sports really well. Yeah. Uh, this is something that only our generation is able to fully see end to end and also will want, you know, there's, there's, there's people that are already stuck in their ways. Like I always say it like, you know, every day a 65 year old retires and a 23 year old gets their first paycheck and they want to put their money into more than just basic mainframe ETFs and, you know, mutual funds. We want cool things. We want to leverage our knowledge. And yeah, like I want, I want to fuel that. Like people are managing their personal financial situation at a lot greater of a rate. You know, crypto, for example, is now democratizing and giving, you know, decentralization is the core of it, managing your own money, your wallet, not just putting your money in a Wells Fargo regulated custodian account. And uh, I think there's there's a shift and, you know, it's cool to be a part of it. Yeah, no, I, I think you're targeting the right market as well. These are the individuals who will be the long term investors in the watch game if watches continue on this investment asset train, which I think they will. Um, Narrative's not going away. Yeah, yeah no. And, and I think it, and you, you did a good job because you, you mentioned in another interview that you did that 
watches really blew up with social media because they became a, a status symbol more than they were. I mean, Rolex always been popular. One shout out to Rolex, like a company, my uncle bought his first Rolex when he graduated college in like 1970 something or 80 something, maybe I don't want to date you. Um, and it was like finished, got a Rolex and like, we're now in 2022. And like, that's still the epitome of like, I made it like my parents got me a Rolex for being successful. Or I bought myself a Rolex for being successful. So like, I don't think that's going away. And I think it's only accelerating. And you're like, right targeted at the audience that you want to capture because if you're capturing these 20 to 30 year olds i mean you've got customers for the next 40 years because the older you get like watches are never watches are for everybody and like i think you're really well positioned to really take this ride with this consumer base yeah and like to even piggyback on that you know so i was grinded on the company the day <laughs> that you know, it kind of hit the news for the first time, what was going on with Russia and Ukraine, the invasion, you know, February, 2022, or was it? Yes, yeah, February, 2022. And uh, I remember I immediately was like, you know, you know, they always say buy the invasion. So I bought a bunch of, um, you know, ADRs of a Russian bank, you know, on, I think it was on Robinhood even, or it was my E-Trade account. Uh, and next thing you know, like obviously a lot changed in the world from then on out, but those ADRs, like whatever I spent on it, which was like considerable amount of money, like all became worthless, untradeable. And it still sits in my account, like frozen worth zero. And, you know, you talk about the brand Rolex, you know, Rolex is in some ways, I like to think of like a global reserve currency. You can literally stuff a Rolex or, you know, wrap one on your wrist, fly into Moscow right now, let's just say the Rolex in the United States is worth 14,500. You can literally get 14,500 in Moscow in rubles for that watch there. And you could, you know, I mean, I was gonna say like you could start a new life and live there. But what I'm getting at is like the, the watch is worth the same amount of money in country A as it is in country B. You can't even convert US dollars to rubles right now. You can't even convert them and get the same amount of money in return. You know, I would always show people when I was trying to like, you know, when you have a new company idea and nobody really gets it and you're just like spewing like a million things regarding it. I remember when I was trying to explain this to somebody about how watches are actually like reserve currency, I would show our Russian distributor in, uh, from Horace, they have a website where they sell watches. These guys, they kill it in Russia. And basically I showed them their website where their watches were listed and they, you know, competitive pricing. And I remember like all the prices were the same as two or three of my friends websites based in Miami that sell watches, like the same watch, same spec, same year, same condition. The prices are the same. And I was using that as a way to kind of point out to people like, Hey, like, you know, these watches can be digitally owned. It's not even about wearing it physically. It's just a way to hold money and move it between places and borderlessly invest. And, you know, yeah, like the the brand Rolex has done such an incredible job at being globally recognized. Like you could probably go to somebody in a third world country and say, hey, like I'll give you this Rolex. Can you give me stuff for it? You can't do that with a lot of other watch brands, even if they're expensive timepieces. Like I probably wouldn't take a, a Tag Heuer right now um, in return for my flight to Pakistan in a month. Like that, that that's not the same value even though tag lawyers are sick watches a rolex is literally regarded as like a, an asset like it's 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 liquid it's liquid you know it's crazy yeah no they, they've done a great job as a company foundation yeah yeah, yeah it's a it's a non-for-profit I, I didn't know that till like pretty recently it's a non-for-profit which is awesome like <laughs> good for them but they're profiting <laughs> oh, yeah. oh no oh, yeah they're they're profiting just doing it the right way <laughs> the the platform supports over 12,000 watches now it's probably more than that I, that was what i got from an old interview you did 39,000 um, we've been hustling 39 i mean dude Cook it. and like that interview came out a month ago for anybody listening like 12 to 39,000 one how are you getting all the data on all these watches like where are you getting it from obviously if it's proprietary you don't have to say it but where are you getting all this data for all these watches and i mean you're a tech company, essentially, like <laughs> you, you're housing all this data, you're, you're, you're becoming very analytical, you own all this amazing data. One, where are you getting it, like I said? And then two, what are you going to do with this data? Are you going to keep it in house? Do you want to monetize it because it's valuable? So to answer question number one, uh, basically, there's several different places where watch prices and market movements take place. 
you, there's for starters, public and private sources. Private sources include, you know, the WhatsApp trading groups, the Facebook groups, the Telegram chats, the iMessage groups, where, excuse me, people trade watches regularly amongst each other. The public sources include, you know, forums, uh, auction houses, peer-to-peer -peer marketplaces, direct-to-consumer websites for, you know, specific in individual traders um, or companies that sell to their audiences. Um, and, you know, basically we've built out what we anticipate to be probably the top 20 to 50, um, platforms. And we, you know, we basically just like track those platforms inside out. And, you know, we also right now are building out a engine that has the ability to ingest this information without us specifically telling it. So for example, you know, if there's a website that has the word watch in it and they're going to start selling, you know, Batman's and they're going to start using the word scratched and scuffed we literally be able to grab like, oh, that's this reference number, BLRO and, you know, or BLNR or whatever the reference is. And, you know, it's pre-owned, boom, 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 pull that into our database. And then obviously, you know, the database matching and mixing and the programming languages is fairly proprietary. Like we have everything from, you know, your typical Python, JavaScript, you know, web scraping um, languages all the way to, you know, Golang and some more, you know, computer science heavy uh, languages. So you know, we're, we're doing a lot with the information we pull in. A better way to say is we do a lot with the data we pull in and how we turn it into information is what's really proprietary. Like you can get the watch market, you know, widely available. You can type in Wimbledon and go on 20 websites and get an idea of what the watch is worth, but how you can do that at scale is a different beast. Um, with that as well, we, uh, we now are starting to have some partnership conversations with um, companies that are going to be able to do things with this information that we can't at the moment due to resources and again, focus. Um, one thing in specific is a lot of machine learning and regression. So, you know, the way I like to describe it is if you, you know, two watches that are similar, uh, a Pepsi and a Batman, you know, both. Yeah. So let's just say last year on 1231, 22 Christmas or new year's Eve, you had a Batman getting sold on eBay for $20,000. And then you had a Batman being traded in a WhatsApp group or listed in a WhatsApp group for $15,000. And the price of Bitcoin at that time was this. And the price of the S and P was this, um, you would basically be able to understand kind of like what macroeconomic conditions were at the moment and what the variation is between a wholesale price and a retail price. Right now, imagine if we had that information for, you know, thousands of watches. And we also had that information for thousands of days. You could technically predict based off macroeconomic conditions in the future, what the variation between a wholesale price and a retail price on a similar model or that specific model could be in the future, just based off like, you know, all right, if the price of Bitcoin is this amount, the S and P is this amount and the watch gets sold on eBay for, you know, $40,000, maybe in the wholesale groups, it would go for 30,000, you know, have that, that 25% uh, difference. Yeah. So that's kind of like the next level of our platform and providing users with those forecasting modules. We're also going to be having a, um, a subscription to the product. That's going to offer you the bottom cash value, the wholesale value, liquidity indices, buy, sell, hold recommendations, um, volume metrics, um, price transparency indices, like all the things you need, uh, bullish and bearish fear and greed, all the stuff, the stuff that you would need to like literally look at a model and say like, Hey, like this is the price of it. It's, you know, pretty transparent that this is the price of it. This is how many are listed. This is how the market's overall sentiment is towards it. Here's the relevant news articles towards this watch. Now I'm confident to make a decision to buy or trade it because I have all this stuff in front of me. Um, so there's actually some really cool stuff in the works with the data that's 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 coming out sooner than later that we're tying up right now. Um, it's gonna be big, dude. That's really exciting. Are, are you are you a technical founder? Are you naturally technical, or did you have to outsource a lot of the super technical coding and all the back end stuff? That was that's. I think that's a very important part of the story because I um, the answer is no. I'm not. I'm not an engineer, uh, but I came from an e-commerce background and an accounting background. I felt like I, you know, knew what I needed to know to run a company, but then you, next thing you know, 
when you're trying to build a platform at this scale, you really need software engineers and you need software engineers with experience in web three in specific, you know, solidity, uh, and you know, smart contract development. There's a lot of engineers that have like one, two, three years of experience and are straight, like, you know, bionic beasts. Like they can just make a contract that can do a ton of functions, pass an audit and actually work like that. A lot of people have been able to tackle solidity. That's how NFTs blew so quickly is people were just, you know, making candy machine, minting generative art, NFTs, boom. Um, so originally the company didn't have, there's a really long story behind it. We'll skip it for today, but basically like, you know, failed, wasn't getting it off the ground, wasn't able to build a team, had a bunch of like hiccups. And then I got introduced to my now co-founders and, um, and that changed everything. So he's not, you know, on the pod right now, but Vinny, um, and Chris, like these two guys specific Vinny with how he just started taking management of the team, building things out. He, I built a design file, a front end because I have a good eye for, you know, UI and human interaction design. Um, we built a product that if I just showed you it right now on a laptop, you'd be like, whoa, this is so cool. But there's like no back end. No like, back end. Just it, a dashboard. Yeah. A dashboard that if you actually click something, nothing would happen. But it looked like, you know, came out of Apple's design team. And basically I showed this to Vinny and he's like, you know, dude, like, you know, you could put this on the internet, but it's going to, it, it could support probably three to 10 users. You know, the second that something has an issue, the whole website goes down. The way he likes to describe it is like you had a very monolithic product and it probably wasn't even monolithic. It was more of a low fidelity or high fidelity, like prototype at that time. And, um, we actually scratched the roadmap of the direction I wanted to go started from the analytics approach, not the marketplace approach. And basically, you know, he's like, helped me, but also led and built a whole entire engineering team under him. And now confidently, and you know, we work hard to say this, but like not a single bit of our work is outsourced. Like every single person is full time, 100% watches IO. And that's the reason why we're able to execute and create whatever's in our minds at such a high rate, like, like frequency and like get it done so well. Um, nothing is, you know, this guy on Fiverr, or this guy's part-time at this other job. Like this is a hundred percent in-house front end, back end, full stack design, every single, every single vertical, um, even down to our vault and, and infrastructure for the physical assets that we're building. Like everything is in-house. It's good. Like it's, it's good to highlight that. And, and I'm happy we got to talk through that because people are founders and it's a solo opener and I got to do it all on my own. And everybody thinks that they could learn be like a jack of all trades is a better way to put that. And when speaking to like founders and people who are creating like real companies, not brands around a personal brand, they always have a technical founder or co-founder that is in there. And people should really lean into that. Like if you're not strong technically, which is not a problem, like you don't need to learn everything about coding. Like that's why there's co-founders and other people that you partner with. So that's like a really great topic that I think we got to talk about. You hinted on something that I had here written that I wanted to go through. You put 75K of your own money into it to try and bootstrap it at first and it didn't and it didn't take off. Such an L. <laughs> then you raise money for the company. We have a lot of founders that listen to the show. What did you learn? One, in the process of bootstrapping it. I mean, that's a lot of your own money in there and failing. And then two, what did you learn in the process of raising capital? Yeah. Um, Great question. And I want to give people some awesome answers on that. So for one, tech is a, a rabbit hole. Like even the storage of the information that we put on the front end, like all this watch model storage, like I could probably get a three bedroom in Miami with those, you know, monthly storage costs. Yeah. Uh, thank you to Google. They, they selected us as a web three partner. We can store our data. Um, and they're comping the bill for a lot of it yeah. for the foreseeable future, um, which helps out a lot. But you know, when it comes to creating technology, I think it's a little bit of a different game than, you know, other types of businesses and businesses that I've been a part of in the past. Like a lot of the times I, you know, they, they tell you like you, you find a problem, get a real quick solution. Like if you noticed that, you know, if you wanted to sell, um, sneakers and brickle, you look around, there's no sneaker stores. 
So let me open up a quick little, you know, sneaker business, or let me, you know, put some SEO and see if people want to buy sneakers, um, you know, and, and, and geofence your advertising and see if there's traction. If you get some hits, then maybe people would want a sneaker store in Brickle and you, you should open one up. Um, you know, like that's, that could, that could all get done within three months to build a tech company. Like it's, it's five years of work, you know, like we're, we're creating a, an MVP. We went live with it. We had to iterate on it. We have to enhance it. It takes a lot of time. And again, I come from a background where the company I ran was a Shopify, um, awesome company, beautiful marketing, you know, really unique and creative, but it's not a tech company, you know, like Shopify. And, and, and there's a, a quote I always tell people, you know, like you can't do anything better than Shopify. So if Shopify doesn't work for you and you want to like, like if your product and your vision is able to get done with Shopify, stay on Shopify. But if you know that Shopify does not provide you the solution, then you have to go this route. And, you know, for me, I was basically trying to outsource everything. You know, we used, we, 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 uh, uh, my old brand that I worked at, we basically would have this outsourced engineer. We'd send him, you know, X amount per month, whatever. And he would just clean up the website, fix it. But then, you know, my friend that was running the company did a lot of the, the core work on the Shopify account. And I always thought that's like how, how it runs. Um, and I, I just like made mistakes like 20 times over. Like I'm going to hire this person to do this. I'm going to hire this person to do this. Like I was taking calls with guys on Fiverr about scraping watch prices and like, you know, Hey, like this is how Chrono 24 works. Can you like pull all the numbers from it? And, and I was always just trying to outsource, outsource and be quick, be a founder, move fast. You know, like the quotes you hear on social media and like, they just like very few of them actually apply. The only thing that applies is do not give up. That's the number one thing. And then, you know, that being said, burnt a ton of money, had like a time where I, you know, I always, I talk about this on some of the other pods, but like, I was just like hitting L after L after L. And I was just like, you know, in the hole, a ton of money. Thank God for some like D gen NFT trades. that just like <laughs> got me a little bit more back on my feet. Um, I, um, there was like one day where I just like, or two day period actually, where I just like drove around South Florida, right? Like up and down Miami to Boca and just like, you know, did nothing except have my notepad open on my lap. And I would drive, think of a thought, you know, at the red light, I would just like write it down, you know, like I need to do it this way. I need to like find a brand partner. I need to, you know, find a person that could really handle e-commerce marketing. Like, like I just wrote down all my thoughts and, um, and I knew I had to like do something different going forward. And that, that, turned into ditching the original idea, which was float game, which was more diamond focused, jewelry focused, had watches obviously as a core, you know, thing, but it included both assets. And I was like, you know, scratch that. I'm going just watches, yeah. just watches. And that's the new vision. And then, you know, one thing led to another, had a conversation with somebody that I literally thought like God sent into my life from this day, but basically, um, started building a team and building a team of engineers, not a team of, you know, guys that are gonna help me like with marketing and branding and all that fun stuff that is important. Um, which now is funny cause like engineering's our strength and like marketing and branding's probably if I had to guess our weakness. Um, but start building a team. And when it comes to fundraising, which is a really important conversation and I kinda want, you know, I, I want like in my life now that I'm realizing certain things, like I want to provide more founders and people with help and assistance with their ideas and how to fundraise and how to get backing. Cause I think it's, um, it's a big mystery box and not many people know how to navigate when they're starting. And I think it's extremely important. Um, but I learned like, you know, for one time and proving yourself, like a lot of the investors, are invested into our company because they've just seen me not give up through the bear market, through SBF getting, you know, incarcerated through, you know, Solana going down the tube to ETH hitting under a thousand bucks. Like they just see me still going. Yeah. And I think, you know, consistency is extremely important. And then also a lot of them are investing because I built a team like this business, you know, we could, we can do a million different things with the money they've given us we can, you know, fail and pick up, like there's a million things that could happen. But at the end of the day, if this team gets along, we work together, we stay smart, we're thinking on our, on our feet, 
you know, like we'll always figure it out. Like they always say like startups fail, founders don't. And I think that's something that a good venture fund or an investor also sees. Um, another really good piece of advice is don't follow the rule book when it comes to getting investors. If you have a friend that wants to give you $6,000, you know, everybody that's a good investor that has had experience with an exit will always tell you like, don't take a check less than a hundred thousand. Like you're not going to want them here in two years or a waste of time. Like go after institutional money. Like everybody that's a successful investor will tell you like, again, they're going to give you their advice. They're going to tell you what's worked for them back to the beginning. And you know, you're going to think you want to follow that man. When you have an idea and you don't have many people believing in you, take the money, leverage that person's network. If they want to put $500, but they want to introduce you to 20 people say, Hey, like you're my first investor, like let's rock. And guess what? Once they put the $500 in, use it to the best, you know, best way possible. And then go get another $500 and another $500, another $500, and just do what you have to do to bring your idea to life. And then continuously do not give up. Like do not follow some sort of like code book or some sort of guideline that, you know, your friend who's been really successful or your ultra rich uncle tries to give you like, just, just, just do what you got to do to, to get to tomorrow and put problems out, keep moving forward, take the money and run and don't be greedy. Like a lot of people, Oh, like I, I think I should be raising at this valuation. When I took our first big, big investor, I was on a call with them and I already had raised a ton of money at a, at a, at an eight digit valuation, which felt really cool pre-product. And they literally negotiated me down like 30, 40% on a call. And I literally texted, I was on the call with Vinny. I texted Vinny and I'm like, pigs get fat, hogs get slaughtered. 30 seconds later, we're both on the call. We're like, yeah, we're doing it. Let's, and we took it. Yeah. They chipped at our valuation. My ego took a blow to the stomach, but guess what? Now they're a part of the company. We have the money we're building. And that's kind of, I think what's important. And a lot of people forget is like, just, just not even forget, but they don't realize like, just, just do the deal, take the opportunity when somebody believes in you agree and run with it, you know? Yeah. I love that non cookie cutter answer. And like, maybe even some people might say unpopular answer, but it's a real answer, which I think is important authenticity is something that I think we lack tremendously in this day and age. So you being able to give your honest answer on how it was for you and what feedback I think is going to be helpful to other, to other people listening who may want to raise. Um, and then also just like, just being like super, super authentic about the way that it went down, what you needed to do, how you didn't give up because we now live in this world of like X and platitudes and like, you got to have a morning routine. You got to wake up at five and eat this and do that. And like, that's just not the case. Like it doesn't need to be that way. Everybody can get to success in a different path. And so many times you ask people a question like that, like what was the raise experience like? And it's this cookie cutter drawn out answer of, I talked to 30 LPs and they introduced me to these funds and then I did this and then that. And like, that's just not how it goes for the majority of the people. So amazing answer to that. You talked about this really interesting thing on, on one of the other podcasts and maybe like a little bit of a tin hat moment here, but you talked about the idea of like watch brand ETFs because fractionalization is something that comes up in the crypto world and you, oh, man. Yeah, I, we don't have to, we're not going to go deep into the fractionalization part. And it, I agreed, you said it didn't make sense in that moment, like buying $5 of a Submariner makes no sense. But what I did like is like getting exposure to a brand's like stainless steel. Like I want to be part of Rolex's stainless steel. So I bought a basket of Submariners, Datejust and Oyster Perpetuals. And like, I'm part of that. Is that something in the works for the platform? Is that something you still think is a viable like opportunity? Yeah, a, a cool question that I like to ask the team and we always talk about, and I think we've come up with some like really, really awesome solutions for is how, and I, I mentioned it earlier in the podcast, how can somebody put a hundred dollars to work? I understand that you want to buy a watch to where it's 15 grand, you know, it's a Rolex, it's like entry price, whatever. But how can somebody who has like a hundred dollars, you know, get exposure and go with it? 
And I don't think the answer is, do you want to own one one hundredth of a Samariner? As much as you would think that's like the hundred dollar entry point. So I think there's going to be a world where, you know, you have your allocation or let's just say you have your wealth allocated into crypto. You have your wealth allocated into stocks and real estate. But you're also going to be interested in having your allocation in other types of things, you know, whether it be vintage vehicles, you know, like Ferraris or watches. And, you know, there's there's a lot to unpack, uh, especially for a shorter pod. But I do think there's a world where people will want exposure to specific traits within different watch brands or watch watches of themselves. And there's already a couple. They're not competitors because anybody at this space that's in our lane is creating an industry with us and if watches become popular on chain then we're uh we're all successful Mm -hmm. um but there are other companies out there that are you know building their little niche markets of like oh like you know a group of 25 friends could have investment into a patek philippe or you know you can buy um you know shares of a watch that get broken down like there's there's people trying it now the u.s has like interesting laws uh, so they're not as so popular over here, but there's definitely going to be a world where, you know, in a short amount of time, you will be able to invest small amounts of money into this asset class and, you know, opportunity comes from that. Yeah, no, and it's something we could talk off camera and riff about because I, it is an interesting topic and I, I do think there is value in that. Here, here's, sorry to interrupt. No, no. One sentence, then I'll, t- I'll tell the camera for fractionalization to make sense. Two things. One is you need a lot of people, yep. a lot of people doing this. Two, fractionalization also doesn't have to be super, super, super small. Like, for example, I think there's a world where five people split ownership of a watch comes before 5,000 people splitting ownership of a watch. So, you know, think about more bite sized solutions than necessarily like a world where, you know, you're trading like little equities of Samariners, a little utopian, you know? Um, but yeah. Yeah. No, and I'm excited because if it does happen, I think you guys are well positioned to be part of that. We're at that point in the show where I asked the famous question. Um, and it's, it's very simple. Jake, what are you excited about in the near future? I'm stoked, uh, for one to release our next big milestone, which is going to be the marketplace. Um, we've been talking a lot about it. I think there's other entrants into the space they're doing a great job we're going to be sitting you know with the big guys on this one and obviously you know the b2b products that we're going to roll out soon etc uh and then two i have a trip to the middle east coming up i'll be visiting pakistan and dubai uh dubai for dubai watch week and i love traveling something we didn't really get into this but you know going abroad visiting places when i was in high school i lived in japan for a bit and just opened up my eyes um so I'm really excited about that. Uh, and the marketplace going live, like a lot of good things to end 2023, which has been a grind of a year. Uh, Dude, for sure. I mean, travel is amazing. And, and we can talk about that because I, I love travel. Um, thank you so much for coming on the show. I actually have a gift for you. I'll give it to you on camera. Ooh. Forgot to. Is it coming off the wrist? No. <laughs> <laughs> maybe, maybe, maybe one day. Maybe one day. So I always try and support like my buddy's brands with the show. Love it. So I have a buddy, um, his brand is called Fictional Affluence. This is sick. He does a play on like uh, fake, fake colleges. So like for Miami local people, University of Hialeah. Hialeah is like the land of opportunity here in Miami. Um, and he did uh, University of Hialeah with a little cafecito to, to represent. Um, but He's building this brand. It's all about these fake colleges and 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 kind of a play on words. But it's incredible. I always want to give my guests a gift and support my boys who have who have their brands and girls. If 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 my girlfriend or somebody around me wants to build a brand, <laughs> um, but this is my gift to you. Thank you so much for coming on the show. No, thank you for having me. So I owe you more hats, um, so that you can dish them out, dude. I. The hats are sick. Um, thank you for giving me one. And I'm sure I'm going to have a bunch of people asking me where I got it. But this is my gift to you for coming on the show. I love that University of Hialeah. That's that's awesome. <laughs> With the colada. <laughs> Dude, for sure. Man, thank you so much, brother. It has been a pleasure. Thank you.